Okay, I'm pleased to be here, and uh, thanks for inviting me to give this talk. I was a little worried I wasn't actually the best speaker for this conference because everyone here has already heard me talk a lot, but looking around the room, there's a lot of people I don't recognize, so maybe it's not so bad after all. Let me get rid of this network thing. Uh, so, uh, so the talk, as the title as makes clear, is about big data. Um, so a couple of kind of generic <laughs> first comments about it. Uh, I think in this community, in the machine learning community, uh, it's one reaction might be, you know, so what? We've already been working on that for a long time. That's the whole sort of genesis of the field. It's about scalability, uh, sort of bringing computer science scalability thinking to uh, statistical data analysis, of what's new. Uh, and that's sort of true, but uh, it's really a much bigger form of scalability. It's really, really about really big data. And so I got interested in this kind of things, these kind of issues. I don't know, five to 10 years ago when I'd go give talks in Silicon Valley. So I'm located close to Silicon Valley. I'd give talks down there all the time. And I'd talk about some brand new procedure that I'd been working on and how cool it was. And here was some data analysis. And all. they'd say, well, that's great, but you know, we have petabytes or terabytes or whatever. Will your stuff work on that scale? And I'd say, well, no. Only if you throw away most of the data will you know, it work. Um, or we also have other constraints like you know, privacy or it's got to be distributed and so on and so forth. I'd say, well, I have to think about that. I don't really know. And they would sort of walk away at that point. They'd sort of, well, these guys haven't thought through. The, these are, guys aren't real engineers. Um, you know, they work on toy problems, basically. Um, so as many of those talks would go on, I just got kind of tired of that and uh, felt like we, we aren't being serious. Um, we are working on toy problems. And I think part of the problem was the association to AI. So I, I re raised that because that's the name of this conference. Uh, you know, machine learning was partly, I mean, I think of it as a long tradition statistical inference, but it was partly the, ner the, the term came about in association with AI. And AI was about kind of one, one entity, a smart machine or you know, individual. Uh, so there wasn't so much the idea of scalability and big. I mean, there was some amount, but not really. But now that really is the issue. It's about really big. Uh, the other uh, um, background comment I want to make is what I like about this topic is it's not about one architecture uh, or one problem. This isn't about trying to sell support vector machines or kernel machines or neural nets or whatever. Um, it's about a big class of problems, and they're all linked in various ways. It's also not about a particular architecture or a particular way of doing things, or it's not about you know, uh, matrix factorization or kind of one specific problem. And I think our field has been, to some extent, too full of that. There's been architectures and problems, and that's all we work on. Um, and this is an interlinked collection of things that have to do with building an engineering field that can roll out solutions to real-world problems with, under various constraints, uh, reliably and repeatedly and, 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 and systematically. That's what society is really demanding for us, from us. Okay, so with those two back-end comments, let me get going. Uh, so the phenomenon I really don't want to uh, spend too much time on. Everyone knows about it. i just make a couple of relevant distinctions. First of all, science kind of probably preceded technology in terms of big data. Uh, particle physics generated huge amounts of data for things like the Higgs boson discovery in confirmatory mode. What they were trying to do was to do a hypothesis test, whether there were Higgs boson or not. And you had to collect huge amounts of data to get the signal to be just a, a, a big enough above the noise to confirm the hypothesis or not. Um, and you know, the energy regimes and all that. So they had to collect huge amounts of data just to test a null hypothesis. So statistically, somehow, it's not that new, but you know, really demanded brand new techniques to build in that scale. More commonly is exploratory mode, so astronomy and genomics. You just collect huge amounts of data, hoping that new phenomena will arise that the next generation of scientists will be able to work on. So you're not trying to confirm a null hypothesis or anything. So statistically, what you're doing there is that it's a multi-hypothesis multi test, huge numbers of hypotheses. You're trying to say, this, this pattern I found, is it real or not? And there are billions of patterns or, or more. You know, which fraction of those patterns are real or not? And so extremely different statistically and probably more relevant to most of the practical problems involving big data. Um, so that's science. And then, of course, technology. We all know about Google and Facebook and all measuring all aspects of our lives. Also medicine, measuring our genome, um, measuring sensors throughout our body, and so on and so forth. And I think what's interesting about all these phenomena is that it makes clear it's not about big per se. It's about granularity. So what's happened now is that there's data av available about every single individual in many, many domains. Where individual can be a person on the internet, uh, where it could be a region of a genome. All regions of, all of the genome are now 
You know, there's data about all of them. All regions of the sky, there's now data about all of them. So it's all the individuals where there's now data. And you want to do inference across the individuals. That's what most scientific questions and then business models are built on. You want to do good search for each individual. So the, the buzzword of personalization is really relevant here. Um, so it's about granularity. And so again, it's a statistical point of view. You have these problems where there's huge amounts of data about some individuals and precious little data about most individuals. Uh, this is multi-scale phenomenon and so on. So that's what we have to tackle. Uh, both statistically and computationally. Um, okay, so that's my little uh, th thing about big data um, as a phenomenon. But what about the conceptual and mathematical issues? There's, of course, many of them. There's not one problem here. There's many, many ones. Well, one of them that's particularly important that has received some attention is kind of the blend of computer science and statistics. So statistics talks about statistical risk, the expectation of a loss. It's kind of the fundamental central quantity. You, you need to control it in various ways. And computer science talks about many things, but particularly about runtime. And if you look, I mean, it's, it's sort of distressing to look at the theory of statistics, statistical decision theory, and not see the word runtime ever mentioned. Uh, you can't give guarantees as a function of the amount of data and the signal to noise and so on and so forth that a certain statistical procedure will run and finish by a certain amount of time, or that it'll scale in a certain way relative to the other resources. It's just not present in the theory. And then similarly, in computer science, it's distressing to see complexity theory you know, have no notion of risk, have no notion that data is a, has a, is a resource, it has a value, and you can trade that value off against time and space and so on, the other things that are typically traded off. All right, so that's really a huge conceptual gap uh, that I think our generation, the next generation, certainly needs to fill. But we need to bring these two fields together at their foundations. Um, so anyway, there has been work about this. Leon Botu has worked on this, Shai Shalov Schwartz, and a number of others, and I think that's really important, prescient work. Um, but it goes really broader. It has to do with statistical, and I guess the word inference is missing there. You have to fill in the word inference. Um, statistical inference under all kinds of other constraints. So in particular, what if there's distributed data? What if there's streaming data? How is the quality of inference, i.e. the risk, affected by these other sorts of constraints? And not just runtime, but other sorts of constraints as well. Uh, privacy is another kind of constraint. Uh, many people don't want to share their data. It's a growing issue. Um, we need to be able to have you know, you know, theory about how to trade off risk and privacy. Uh, so there's lots and lots of these things. There's many ways to think about bringing statistics and computer science together. And uh, this uh, issue of big data to me is really the forcing function. Uh, there could have been other reasons to bring it together. In fact, in some ways, stat, uh, you know, AI stats is an example. AI kind of helped to bring them together. But I think this goes deeper. All areas of computer science, all areas of statistics, and science and technology are interested in this phenomenon. They all see in, their, in that phenomenon something that affects them directly in their program. And in my career, that's the first time I've ever seen that, that every area of science and technology and the methodological sciences, computer science and statistics, see themselves as fundamentally involved in this issue. And that's really, really striking. Um, so let me say a little bit more about this data as a resource idea. So I'm going to put on a computer scientist sat hat for a minute. Uh, so, theoretical computer science studies the management of resources, time, space, and energy. And, you know, it's trade-offs, uh, big O of N um, equations that relate these quantities. And you get lower bounds, and, and certain algorithms have certain rates, and so on. In those equations, you don't see data appearing. Data is the thing you apply the resources to. It's not a, um, a resource itself. It's a workload. And the, the real issue of big data, one way to think about it, is that data itself is really should be viewed as a resource. You're willing to trade off the amount of data against the other resources you have, time and space and accuracy and, um, and, and so on. So, um, you know, as with time and space, this resource should combine in a nice theoretically controlled way so that you can give guarantees. And that's just what's missing right now. In fact, it's not the case that if you give me more data, I typically do, even, I do better, which is certainly the, truth with the case with other resources like time and space. You give me more cycles or more memory on my computer, I only do better, but that's not the case with data. Uh, so let's think that through just quickly. I mean, these are not unfamiliar issues, I think, to most of you, but I just want to elaborate them. Um, so, you know, as you get bigger and bigger data, uh, you're not in a classical statistical situation where you want to just you know, estimate the mean of a population. You get more and more data. The error bar goes as 1 over square root of n, and if n's huge, the error bar is vanishing. Um, and there's not even a small, finite number of things you're trying to estimate or test. There's a growing number of things. And in fact, really what typically happens is that there's an exponentially growing number of things you're interested in. Because that's the whole point of gathering all this big data. You're in exploratory mode. You want to explore things. And the things you want to explore are typically combinations of all the, the covariates or the columns of your table. 
and there's exponential numbers of those. So you're willing to consider these as all interesting patterns you could find in the data. There's an exponential number of them. And so as you get more and more data, the number of hypotheses you will consider is exponential in the amount of data. All right? And that just is you know, problematic. And you don't have to be much of a statistician to realize the problem here. Okay? And that is really the problem. People start to collect huge amounts of data, and they start to look for patterns, and they find white noise. So I think the media is full of this. I think science is full of this. And it's growing. It's a problem. So actually, when people mostly, if the media ever calls me up and asks, well, what's the big data? What's, what's so great about big data? I say, what's the wrong about big data is that it's going to cause havoc with false positives. Personal medical decisions are going to be based on big data analyses that are suspect. And we're, gonna, we're, you know, we're full of this. So as a community, this is one of the big issues we have to face. Now, there is, of course, there's you know, family-wide error rates, false discovery rates, and so on, that and statistics have been developed to control huge numbers of hypotheses. But really, it's not huge. It's, it's, it's never been rolled out at scale. It's, the scalability considerations haven't been brought to bear on this kind of statistical control. So if those algorithms for doing family-wise control or false discovery rates don't really scale, uh, then people will not use them. They will turn them off. Um, you know, it'll cost them too much to run those algorithms. Uh, so now we're back at a more familiar terrain, is that all algorithms for doing statistical analysis of any kind, estimation, hypothesis testing, and so on, are algorithms, and they take a certain amount of runtime. And most problems in real life, you have a limit on your runtime. Maybe it's a millisecond you know, for search or something. Maybe it's microseconds in finance. Maybe it's seconds. Maybe it's days in medicine. There's always a temporal budget. And if you had a small amount of data, you would meet your temporal budget with no problem. When you get huge amounts of data, you've got this resource. You'd love to exploit it. But you can't run your algorithm the amount of time that you have allocated to you. So what do you do at that point? Well, you can start to throw away data, but you need to know what rate to throw away the data. And that means you know how, you know how risk uh, trades off against time. And that's exactly the issue I'm saying that we don't know how to do uh, in general. Um, or you can start to back off to simpler algorithms. You've got an n-cubed algorithm or an n-log n algorithm. You'll back off at some point as you get more and more data. But if you don't back off in the right way at the right time, your risk could continue to increase as you back off to a stupider algorithm if you're not controlling the risk as a function of the, the uh, accuracy of the algorithm. Uh, so again, these are, I think, really fundamental problems that um, you know, I don't think are solved. And so big data really is bringing us to work on these things. And I, I think it, these problems won't go away. This is several decades of research needed. Uh, so now, finally, let me turn to what I'm going to talk about in this talk. Um, this is joint work with a number of people that I had on my first slide, uh, Vincat Chandra Sekaran, John Ducci, Martin Wainwright, Yu Chen Zhang. Um, and uh, a unifying theme in all of this work is to, uh, we're trying to unify computer science and statistics fundamentally. That's kind of what the game is. How do you do that? Well, you could start with complexity theory and start to bring statistics into it. And I find that hard. Complexity theory is just not, it's very kind of an awkward formalism to work with to bring in probabilities. Um, a way that I found much more successful, maybe it just reflects my own heritage, is to plant myself firmly in statistics and think about the risk and bring computational considerations to bear on the risk. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing in the, in the rest of this talk. Um, so we're going to try to understand trade-offs among various quantities as constraints on statistical risk. And the math under this, which I won't be getting too much in this talk, is really kind of familiar. It's, not, it's hard to bring computer science and statistics directly into contact, uh, but geometry, information theory, and in particular optimization are uh, the key technical tools that are being used in all the work I'll talk about. Uh, so um, here's the outline. Just really briefly, some background on mini-max decision theory, um, and then talk about some of these constraints. So privacy is a particularly uh, elegant one to talk about. I'll start there. Uh, then communication, if you have distributed co computing, how does that affect statistical risk? Uh, and then I've actually decided to swap out the last part and talk about something a little bit different. But um, I will allude to how you bring in, uh, you know, basically oracle inequalities from optimization or lower bounds oracle uh, ideas to uh, serve as a surrogate for computation when you add computation as a constraint. Um, all right, so just a little bit of quick background to make sure we're all on, all on the same page. First of all, this will be an entirely frequentist talk today. There was, of course, Bayesian and, and frequentist approaches to, the, to inference. We're going to be um, frequentist today, and I can tell you a little bit later why I've made that choice in this line of work. Um, so Wald is the person I tip typically go back to thinking about where this all came from. Um, so the setup is that you have a family of probability distribution, script P. Um, that can be non-parametric. It can be really large. Uh, and a parameter is just a, a functional on a probability distribution in that family. It doesn't have to be a literal uh, finite dimensional parameter. It can be um, growing with the amount of data and so on. 
Um, anyway, theta of p is a parameter. We have an estimator, which could itself be a functional estimate of some kind. It doesn't have to be a classical estimator. And then we compare those two with, via loss function, uh, theta hat compared to theta p. And the risk, then, is the expectation of the loss taken under the expectation where p has been held fixed. So p appears twice in the risk equation. Uh, now, you don't know which p you have when you get your data. You're the statistician. You're trying to infer p. Uh, and so one way to think about a priori control on this quantity and then you know, theoretical study of it is to take the, the supremum overall, the worst case overall p, and then that quantity has no more p in it, and you can study it. Um, and, you know, the expectation takes away the randomness, and then the supremum takes away the unknown p, and you now just have a number that you can study as a function of various things, including typically classically the number of data points. But today, we're going to be studying this as a function of other constraints we're going to be bringing to bear on it. All right, so the first one, uh, we'll be uh, studying uh, how privacy impacts Minimac risk, and joint work with John Ducci and Martin Wainwright. Um, all right, so I, I don't think I have to, uh, especially being in Europe, uh, talk too much about privacy. We're all aware that you know, many people have various concerns about it. Not willing to let their personal data be used for, for what? Uh, well, this is where it really becomes interesting to think about what's the trade-off in using your data. It's not just should you use my data or not. It's not a legal question. Uh, it's, to, it's an inferential question. So if I have a certain kind of disease, um, say Crohn's disease is a good example. It's a lifelong disease. I would like to have my data used to study Crohn's disease because things, good things will be learned about it, and that will help me directly and probably my children. Uh, so if you want to use my genome and my phenotype for studying that, I'm willing. All right? uh, on the other hand, if you want to use my data so that you can do ad placement, I'm not willing. That's me. Right? Everyone in the room has a certain knob they'd like to turn where they would put privacy um, as a function of the, the, the loss. That's really fundamental what it's about. It's a statistical question. Once you tell me the loss function, is it about disease, is it about ad placement or whatever, then I'll tell you how much I'm willing to give up on my privacy. So it's got to be fundamentally brought together. Um, so we have to quantify, we, we can quantify loss and risk, that's statistics. We've got to quantify privacy. And after a number of papers to try to, to sort of think about the best way to do this, we finally ended up going to Differential privacy, which is the most widely studied framework in theoretical computer science and database theory, has a number of advantages in those theories, and here it also has some advantages as well mathematically. So at the end of the day, we've used differential privacy as our constraint, and our goal is to show how to bring that into contact with statistical risk. All right, so here's our model. It's, it's a strong model called local privacy, where we assume that people who hold data, x1 through xn, aren't willing to give up their data to anybody, uh, including the statistician, say Google, which is that box theta hat. Uh, so what they're going to do instead is give a, um, a, a damaged or um, altered version of their data, Z1 through Zn. Uh, they're going to locally compute a Z1, a Zi from Xi, and then let Zi be shown to the statistician and potentially the public. Uh, so we have a channel which relates uh, Xi and Zi, and that channel will be called Q. Um, and so, as in uh, you know, uh, various areas of information theory, we have uh, the channel is acting as a constraint on our analysis. So, what classes of, con are, of channels are we going to use? Um, so, the setup is that we have individuals who hold private data. It's drawn from a distribution P. The estimator, on the other hand, is built on Z. Okay. Um, moreover, there is interactivity allowed among these estimators. That's actually one of the strengths of differential privacy that I alluded to earlier. It allows you to handle that in a pretty neat way. Um, all right, so what is differential privacy, if you haven't seen this before? Um, so this is kind of a likelihood ratio uh, constraint. Uh, so Q is our channel, and um, so Z is a uh, output of the channel, and we say, well, you take any event in some sigma algebra, you, some set of events you care about. Um, so the probability that Z lies in that event, given X is the data, uh, you know, differs from uh, the probability that, that z lies in that event given that x prime is the data. And conceptually, you should think of x as like the data with me in it, and x prime is the data without me in it. So if you're trying to figure out if I'm within that data set or not, uh, you'd like to be able to detect that. And this equation tries to make that detection difficult. So it says that ratio of those probabilities, that likelihood ratio, is small, uh, where, ep where alpha is the tuning parameter of quantifying how small. And then you take a supremum over all events s, uh, and you take a supremum over all x and x prime. Uh, other form, sometimes formulations of this involve x and x prime differing by, say, one bit uh, or, or uh, a hemi distance of one, uh, but we're not going to assume that for this, part, this talk. 
Um, all right, so this is typically studied in a situation in databases where you have a database and you'd like to run a query on that database and get an answer. And I say, well, I'm not going to let you see the data in the database. You're going to run it on some other messed up database and you'll get an answer and you want your query on the change, the alter database, to be close to the query you would have gone on the original data. And it's, that's kind of what's driven most of the thinking and research on this. Not all of it, but most of it. Uh, our problem, of course, is different. We don't care about the data in the database so much. We care about learning or inference. Behind the data, there was a thing that generated the data, and we're going to be getting new people who aren't in the database who are going to come in wanting to say treatment or you know, you know, a new entity that we're going to want to classify. And we want to say, for that new entity, can I make a good prediction? even though you didn't get to see the data in the database quite. All right, so that's the, that's the problem. Um, okay, so let's just remind ourselves where we were with minimax risk. Minimax risk is that you take the supremum over P of the risk, of, and that's given there in the red, and, and then the minimax is to now you know, to find the best estimator under that criterion. Okay, so that's the infimum over theta hat. So there's just classical minimax risk. So all we're going to do is to change this to make it call this to define a notion of alpha private minimax risk. We also take an infimum now over the channels, and the channels Q have to respect differential privacy at level alpha. Okay, so guarantee the privacy at level alpha. That's your channel. And now try to get and do minimax risk. Okay, so that's obviously a reasonable definition, meaningful definition at least. And now the question is, could the good mathematics come out of this? If you start to analyze procedures, you know, do the classical rates you get out for minimax, which are you know, extremely useful, uh, how are they altered by imposing this new constraint? And you could do the mathematics to see how it's altered. Okay? So do you get a new rate that reflects this alpha parameter in particular? Um, so just to give you a quick vignette here, um, let's suppose you're, you're looking at people going to the hospital. Uh, they're admitted for various reasons having to do with substance abuse. And so here's someone who comes in and uses alcohol and cocaine and not these other drugs. And that, so that's a typical data point. The underlying thing you'd like to infer are the true proportions of, uh, of the prevalence of these substances. So 0 0.45, 0 0.32, and so on and so forth. Um, so we like to infer that from the data. Um, so just to do a little mathematical exercise here, let's consider that we're trying to estimate the mean theta of p, okay? And let's look at the L infinity norm as our loss, uh, defining uh, a risk function based on that. And let's take the uh, class of, how, of distributions to be non-parametric, all distributions supported on a compact space. All right, so here's the classical minimax rate for this. This is, you know, out of the textbooks. Uh, minimax rate goes as... Uh, 1 over square root of n, and in the, d in the numerator, there's log logarithm of d. The, uh, these are uh, d-dimensional vectors. Um, okay, and the sample mean actually achieves this rate, so it's kind of part of the classical minimax theory. All right, so now the question is, what if I put in a channel that uh, at level alpha smudges up the data in some way? Now, we're not saying how. Uh, you know, this is not a, me a mechanism-free argument. We're just saying if you achieve differential privacy under some mechanism, there will be now a parameter alpha, which I can use in my analysis. Right, and how does it affect the minimax rate? All right, here's the answer. Uh, you get another factor of square root of d in the numerator, and you get n alpha squared of the denominator, where there was an n before. Okay, so effectively, the, sam the, the effective sample size has gone from n uh, to n alpha squared to achieve a certain level of risk. Right, and alpha, you know, is a knob you can turn, and so that's not so bad. Uh, n alpha squared, you would know that a priori. And so if you wanted to get a good risk, achieve a low rare rate or whatever, you would just gather enough data so that n alpha squared is, you know, gives you a, a good enough risk, and that would involve having more data than you had before, but you know, not so badly. The d in the, in the numerator is a bit more troublesome. Uh, it's troublesome for if you believe differential privacy, you know, which is a very strong notion of privacy. Uh, it's, a, it's a bad penalty to pay in terms of the, uh, the dimension of the problem. So for high dimensional problems, um, you know, other ideas will, will go to, are going to be needed. Um, Anyway, that's a little vignette, but it turns out we've done this analysis now over a wide class of estimators and uh, problem classes and losses, and the basic message that comes out of it is this is what happens. The, the effective sample size goes from n to n alpha squared, so alpha appears in a very simple way, uh, the privacy parameter, a very simple way in this analysis, divided by d. Um, now, whenever you do that kind of analysis, you'd like to say, does that, that's just a piece of math, does it lead to new procedures? Um, and so the answer here is that it does, uh, with a little twist at the end of the story. So here's an example of a data point. Say someone comes in, they're a 10100, 
Um, one way of thinking about how to smudge up the data is to add noise to it. And a typical form of noise that's used in this literature is Laplace noise. It's heavy-tailed noise. Um, Gaussian noise isn't heavy-tailed enough to give you the results you want, so Laplace noise turns out to be optimal in various situations. So you could do that. You could add Laplace noise, and, then the, and now Z is the noisy vector you transmit to the statistician. Um, now, in our analysis, we're able to show this is not optimal. This is actually quite much too large, uh, provably. Uh, it's not the optimal mechanism. So is there an optimal mechanism? And here is one. Um, so here, what we're going to do, same data on the left, we're going to define two views, which are just randomly chosen bits. So you draw V uniformly in 0, 1 to the D, and maybe you get 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. And now you also consider 1 minus V, the flip of that. All right, and now, uh, given the data x, I'm going to transmit to the statistician either view v or 1 minus v. And I'll do it with probability proportional to the alpha parameter, e to the alpha, 1 over plus 1 plus e to the alpha. Uh, so with pro probability proportional to that, I'll transmit the closer of v and 1 minus v to x to the statistician. So I am giving the statistician information, it's just degraded information. All right, now intuitively that seems maybe like a worse mechanism than Laplace noise. You're giving less, you know, you're, you're taking this random thing and giving it to the statistician. It seems worse. But, you know, this is where math helps you. It tells you, no, in fact, this is actually good. In fact, it, it's optimal. It beats the Laplace noise mechanism. Um, and in fact, now if you do that, that's the math. If you do this empirically, uh, here is some real data from the drug abuse warning network. There's the L-infinity error coming down. And the additive Laplace uh, error is uh, the green curve there. The optimal procedure is the blue. So it's really quite a bit better. Um, all right, the last little twist here is that this mechanism was actually already known. There's a famous paper by Warner in the statistical literature in 62 or 3 um, where he talked about uh, privacy issues and he proposed this particular mechanism. There was just no proof that it was optimal or good. Um, and this, is the, this paper shows that it actually turns out that, that the optimal mechanism has been known in the literature for you know, about 40 years. Uh, just briefly, a little bit about how this is proved. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Um, but uh, basically, the story involves uh, analyzing a marginal probability distribution. So there's the, uh, you integrate out the, over the Q, the channel Q, um, under the data generating distribution. And so now you get the marginal probability of events in the, uh, the, the, the space that the session actually gets to see. And you want to know how much contraction between the original P's does this induce. Um, so if you know about minimax lower bounds, but you'll know that what you do if you start with an estimation problem is you turn it into a collection of hypothesis testing problems. You know those by P1, P2, Pj, and so on. And then you try to control the error among those hypotheses, grid of hypothesis uh, testing problems. So you have to say how far apart those are, and you get rates from those. Now we've messed the data up via this Q. We want to know how much contraction among these hypotheses does that induce. Uh, and so uh, the core of our analysis is a little theorem that uh, you know, relates callback Liebler divergence between these marginal distributions, symmetrized. Uh, when you get this grid of hypotheses, you need to get rates. And uh, uh, you use the Fano lower bound in particular, and that needs to be upper bound the callback Liebler divergence. So an upper bound of callback Liebler divergence is given by a difference in total variation between the original probabilities P1 and P2 in the X space, and then this contraction factor which has in it the alpha parameter and n. Uh, so the, the red part is new, uh, and if you do a little Taylor expansion, you'll see this goes as n alpha squared. Uh, so that's actually how n alpha squared comes out of the, the analysis. It gives you an idea of how it comes out. Um, all right, and here's some other, we now have a, a couple of papers on this. Uh, fixed design regression, convex risk minimization gives you the same kind of results. Um, and, and also non-parametric SD estimation. Um, okay, so that's that's first part of my talk. Uh, giving an idea of what it might mean to take a theory of this purely statistical and adding some constraints that, you know, are arguably statistical but come out from uh, from a different set of um, um, a different perspective on the, on the estimation problem. Okay, um, the second part will be really brief, and leaving me time for the third part. Uh, so that was one constraint: privacy. Let's look at another one. So what about communication? Suppose I got all my data distributed on multiple servers. Maybe because they're so huge I can't transmit the data, or maybe because there's administrative barriers among my data. Um, so I have to then, as a statistician, face the fact that I can't put the data all in one place. How does that affect uh, estimation procedures and the, the best we can expect to do? All right, so this is joint work I should have alluded to with, again, with John and Martin, and also Yu Chen uh, Zhang has, has done, uh, lead, you know, led this project, in fact. 
Uh, so communication strengths is the same kind of picture as before. Uh, we're going to have data uh, x1 through xm. m is the number of machines now. And um, these are distributed. Uh, and to get the data, the, to do analysis at a central location, we've got to compress the data. So z1 and z through zm now will be not just messed up versions of the data. They'll be compressed versions of the data. So messed up in a different sense. Um, so uh, we compress and we send this to a fusion center and we want to get a trade-off among the, the bit rates, the compression, and the, the statistical utility. All right, so uh, here's where our little recipe uh, just gets applied once more. You um, write down the minimax risk, the infimum over procedures of the maximum over the probability distributions. And now we add another constraint. Let's take the infimum over all um, protocols, pi sub b, uh, that respect a, a bit rate constraint uh, at rate b. So we can only transmit b bits um, uh, over the, uh, to the central computer, and we will therefore uh, uh, only allow uh, protocols that, uh, compression protocols that respect that constraint. And now how does that change the rate? Um, okay, so you set this problem up and you uh, attack it with pretty similar um, uh, machinery. Again, minimax lower bound kind of machinery involving hypothesis testing and Asua and, 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 and LACOM and so on. And um, you, um, uh, you get out rates. So let me show you a little vignette again to kind of give you a sense of how this goes. Uh, let's just consider estimation in a normal location family. Uh, so we don't know the mean of a, of a multivariate d-dimensional Gaussian. Um, and of course, if you have, the, uh, you ask what's the minimax rate for this, this is really quite classical. Uh, it just goes as uh, dimensionality d divided by the total amount of data. If there are m machines and there are n data points on each machine, the total amount of data is n m. So that's how the risk scales uh, if we're talking about L2 risk. Uh, and now you can ask what happens if you introduce this bit rate constraint. And you do the same kind of mathematics as before. You upper bound some information theoretic quantities and um, you know, expand and so on and so forth. And here's the answer that you get out. Uh, it actually has an upper and lower bound in, in this case um, that uh, are shown there. So the minimax risk is upper bounded by, again, the same factor sigma squared d over nm, the classical minimax rate. But then there's a new factor out there. It goes as an, another factor of d, log of the number of machines divided by um, maximum or, um, minimum of b and d. Okay, so one way to think about this is that um, there is uh, that if you send uh, approximately d bits, uh, you can get out optimal estimation. You will the first term will be insignificant relative to the second, and that's really interesting because it shows that there's a relationship between the communication complexity here and the dimensionality of the problem. That that wasn't expected. Uh, that, that there was a relationship between number of data points and communication complexity, sure, but there's an actual relationship between dimensionality of the problem and the communication complexity. Um, okay, so I was going to do this third part, uh, some work I'd been doing with Venkat, China, uh trying to bring uh, computation in as, a, as a net, yet another constraint on minimax risk. Um, but I've decided in my last 20 minutes or whatever I've left here to do a, a, a different angle on, on computation that I just think makes some points I want to make. So I'm going to turn off that set of slides and uh, go to this. Okay, yeah, so, um, so this is uh, less theoretical, a little more concrete, um, and it brings up some points that I think are really critical, mostly about subsampling when you get large amounts of data. Um, so I like this issue because, you know, if you get lots of amounts of data, kind of the natural thing to do is to subsample, throw away the data at some rate, all right? Uh, and you don't have to often throw away lots of, lots of data. Now, lots of problems that we're kind of used to in machine learning, that's not such a big deal. If I've got, you know, uh, you know, X number of data points, and I throw that to a support vector machine or something, and then I take one-tenth of that, if there's a huge amount of data, the answer to the support machine comes up should sort of roughly be the same. You know, it shouldn't matter that much. And we should maybe try to quantify that and so on, but, you know, intuitively, uh, subsampling shouldn't be that big of a deal. It should only be a helpful mechanism we have at our disposal. Okay, but in statistics, we're often not interested in the output of a black box machine learning system. We're interested in the error bar. We're interested in the accuracy of that system, a posterior having seen the data. I'm going to give you an answer, which is 0.7. And uh, in your mind, you had a threshold in mind. If the answer was over 0.65, you would get a, you know, a surgical operation. Um, and it's 0.7. How much over 0.65 is that? I want to know before I actually decide to have that operation. Right? I don't want to just get an answer. I want an error bar. And I tend to look at the world more in terms of the error bars. You really often, in my real-life decision-making, you want the error bar at least as much as you want that point estimate. 
Okay, now I know this has not been driving the machine learning field to think about this, but I think it really will in the future as we think about a lot of these huge numbers hypotheses we're testing and, and which of them are different from zero. That was an error bar question. All right, so let's then so refactor ourselves. Now, what, let me, I was going to make a point which I didn't quite drive all the way home, which is now if you're interested in the error bars and not just the point estimate of the black box, error bars typically go as 1 over square root of number of data points for lots of estimators. Not all estimators, and that's kind of ha most of the point here. Um, so 1 over square root of number of data points. If I subsample by a factor of 10, the error bar is off by a factor of square root of 10. That's disastrous. It's just completely wrong. Okay, so subsampling just naively just completely gives you the wrong answer when you think about the full inferential problem of uncertainty in your estimate and not just the problem of get at a point estimate. Okay, so that to me is really interesting because we have to subsample when we have vast amounts of data, but if we do it in a naive way, we're going to just give off ridiculous answers, give back ridiculous answers. So that's a problem we have to focus on. That's an example of a problem we have to focus on. Okay, so now let's get into the meat of this. Uh, first of all, again, an analogy. Collaborators here, Ariel Kleiner, uh, Perna Sarkar, and Amit Talawakar. We've been working together at Berkeley for several years on this, on this class of ideas. Um, okay, so just to remind you what the bootstrap is, you know, you don't see bootstrap talked about very much anymore. Um, in this conference, I don't think I've seen it in the abstracts and all, but it should be. It should be one of our sort of things that we use all the time for all kinds of, you know, or, Problems. I mean, it's not just the bootstrap, but things like the bootstrap should be part of our natural discourse. So um, what is the bootstrap? Uh, well, we have data x1 through xn. Uh, from that, we're going to compute some you know, black box parameter estimate. And this could be a prediction. It doesn't have to be a parameter. It could be a function. Uh, it's a functional on the data. That's all I care about in data points. Uh, but I'm not interested in that functional per se. I'm not trying to make that black box faster or subsample and all that. I'm interested in the assessment of the quality of the estimate i.e. a confidence region for this estimate. Okay, the estimate was 0.7. I want to know, is that lie between 0.65 and 0.75, or, or what was my bound? All right, now, a lot of times in, the, in this field, we tend to give bounds that are a priori. Before you saw the data, you give a generalization bound, so-called, which is a bound on the thing. Before you saw the data. Well, well clearly, it's not going to be a very good bound in general, and they often aren't. Uh, this is, the bootstrap is not about that. The bootstrap is about, after having seen the data, what is the bound on the, on the, on the, in the certainty? You know, a, a much more useful question in practice. So that's what we're going to try to get here. Now, how do you do this? Well, you could be a Bayesian or a frequentist. The Bayesian basically gets the error bar by putting in a prior, which has a certain uncertainty, and propagating that through the likelihood. Right? But in a lot of these big data set situations, it's very hard to know what prior to put in and how do you control that and how do you calibrate that. So I tend to prefer uh, to be uh, a frequentist for a lot of this line of work, uh, you know, largely for that kind of classical problem. Uh, so the frequentist approach to error bars is kind of interesting. Uh, it says what you do conceptually is you imagine you had not just one data set and you were conditional on that, you have multiple data sets. And uh, you evaluate or estimate on each of these multiple data sets and that gives you fluctuations in the estimator and those fluctuations define a, you know, a, a span, a range. The, the, the distribution of the fluctuations is called the sampling distribution and you then uh, 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 summarize that in some way. Um, so that's what psi would be. Psi, for example, would be the interquartile range of the, of the theta ends sampled on multiple data sets. All right. Uh, so that's the unachievable frequent, that's the definition of a frequentist error bar effectively, is that you imagine you had multiple data sets. You only have one data set, so how can this possibly be a useful idea? Uh, well, you know, as a statistician, you think, well, if the, the underlying the data was a population that, you know, that generated the data, it's typically continuous because, you know, all data are, you know, are, are, can be observed. Um, and so you conceptually think about the sampling distribution in the following way. So um, there's a, th this is the, I like to view this as the supreme being has this up in, up in heaven. Uh, supreme being has the population in hand and can generate not just one data set, but a second data set and an M data sets. And can compute the estimate on each one of those data sets and then put that into some function that assesses the quality, that interquartile range or some other estimation of concentration. All right, and I also like to point out that this is a parallelizable procedure. So up in heaven, the supreme being has a cloud computer. I like the metaphor; really works well, right? <laughs> and in parallel, they resample, they 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 generate these multiple data sets, and then they have their sampling distribution, and they get themselves an error bar. Her, she, or he gets an error bar. All right, all right. So that's the picture. And then bootstrap is this really just elegant substitution principle that you take the thing on the left and you replace it with the empirical distribution. So here's the motivation. In heaven, there, the Supreme Union has a, a, has a uh, population. He or she generated a single data set to give to us. We take that data set and form the empirical distribution, say a histogram. 
Empirical distribution lives in the space of distribution. That's a measure. It happens to be discrete, but it's a measure. All right? And just like any distribution in the space of distributions, it can be used to generate data. It was based on data, but it can be used to generate more data. All right? You can generate one data point from that empirical, or two, or 12, or however many you want. Okay? Now, if the empirical was based on n data points, it's kind of natural to think about using it to generate n new data points. Now, when you do that, what you're doing is sampling with replacement. Right? That's a discrete distribution, and if you sample it, you'll get one of the original data points, but in the next draw, you can get that same data point again and again. And you're just sampling with replacement. All right? So now what you do is you take uh, a theorem out of, that all of us know and love, the Uniform Convergence Theorem, which says that um, that empirical is an approximation of the population uniformly, uniformly on that x-axis, but also uniformly in the space of probability distributions. So a very nice general notion of uh, approximation. All right, so now all we do is we forget there was ever a population. We pretend that that's the population, and now we're a supreme being in, up, uh, using our cloud computer where that's the population. It was based on data that we got from the supreme being, but forget that. It's our population. All right, so now oh, no, we use the same diagram as before, but on the left-hand side we put in the data which we used to form an empirical. I should have put a little histogram there. And then we sample from the empirical one time, two time, m times. We get out fluctuations in the estimator. Um, uh, and we put it into the exact same formula for quality, uh, a confidence interval formula of some kind, and we get out an answer. So that diagram is exactly the same diagram as the Supreme Bean is using. All that's happened is that one distribution has been replaced by another one. Now, if that distribution is in the soup norm close to the truth, and if all those operators are continuous in a functional analytic sense, then the answer will be close to what the Supreme Bean gets. Right? And that's the, that's the principle of the bootstrap. It's just a approximation principle together with continuity. Okay, so you also see what could sometimes break. If you don't have con continuity throughout all that flow diagram, uh, it can break. But that is the conceptual idea of the bootstrap, and now you can sort of easily start to think of ways to generalize this. Okay, so there we go. That's the classical bootstrap. Uh, now, what if I have a, you know, say a terabyte of data? Now, let's think computationally. What breaks? All right, well, if I have a terabyte of data, um, when I resample a terabyte with replacement, I get about 632 gigabytes. Just do a little piece of math, okay? Um, so each one of those arrows leading from the central data set source to this distributed servers has got to carry 632 gigabytes. All right, that's, that's, too, that's no good. That's going to take forever. On some, on, it'll flood the network, and you know, you're going to have to engineer around it. It'll take a long time, both to build the system and also to run it in practice. Um, so that's a problem for the bootstrap by re replacing, t taking all the data and resampling with replacement n times, where n is huge, you're flooding your network with replicates. And even though it's distributed, you can't really use it in a distributed setting. Okay, so I've sort of said that on this um, slide here. Let me just skip that. Okay, so have people thought about that? Well, yes and no. There was a line of work that's known as subsampling. There's a book about it, very nice book. Um, that, in fact, does the nat natural thing, which is to say, let's take n data points and let's look at a subsample of those endpoints. They were actually motivated to do this because of these failure modes of the bootstrap. Um, if, there's, if there's lack of continuity, the bootstrap can fail. And uh, subsampling was viewed as a way to get around some of those theoretical failure modes. But computationally, it's, very, it's, it's what you would have thought of doing. But as we're going to see, it has a bit of some, some drawbacks. Uh, so here's the basic idea of subsampling. I had the original data point of size n. I'm going to take a small subsample of it, say b of size, say, square root of n, to be concrete. And, um, and now I'm going to apply the estimator to that, that, those B points, just directly. I apply the estimator. I get out a number, and I'm going to do that now many times. There are N choose B subsets, so I can do this many times, in a Monte Carlo way. And now I'll get out fluctuations of my estimator. But I hope you can see there's a problem done naively. Uh, those fluctuations are on the wrong scale. They're on the scale B, and the data is on the scale N. We want to get the error bars on the scale N, not on the scale B. And in fact, if B is small, our, our error bar is going to be too large. We think we have less data than we do. So we got the wrong error bars. All right, so the people who proposed this, of course, were aware of this, and they, they noted that, well, yes, you have an issue here. You have to analytically correct the error bars. All right, so if this estimator goes as a square root of n estimator, you would uh, you know, divide and multiply. You would uh, multiply by a factor of square root of um, n, uh, b over n to correct. You get smaller. That would correct your errors for be too big to be on the right scale. But now you have to know what is the rate of your estimator. Is it square root of n or not? If it's just a box inside of a database, a so-called user-defined function, 
I should also note that we got into this whole line of research because of some database research that we were working with, wanting to get error bars for, on queries, a very different perspective from classical database people. Um, so uh, you'd have to know that, and that's a problem. Another problem, though, is if you try this out in practice, they're, they're, it, 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 it fails in, 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 in a certain way. Uh, so here's an example of some experiments we've done. When we were first starting this line of research, we thought this was the answer, and so we were, we were trying it out, and we were having troubles. So here's a little example where we have a covariate space of size 100, uh, 50,000 data points, sampled uh, from a student T. We're just going to do linear regression of least squares, and we did this synthetically so we know the, um, the real sampling distribution, and we can get a confidence interval for all of our components of the, um, uh, the co coefficient vector and get a relative confidence interval wide because we know the truth. All right, so the main point on this slide is that B of n formula. So B is going to grow at rate n to the gamma for various values of gamma. Uh, so one half would be square root subsampling, and all the way up to one would be no subsampling. And here's some examples of results. Um, on the x-axis, you have the time as these algorithms are resampling or subsampling. This is on a single computer, so this is just the amount of time it requires on that computer to do the process. And this is the relative error, which is decreasing, uh, not going all the way to zero because the number of data points is held fixed. Uh, and the blue curve is the bootstrap, so it comes down um, pretty nicely and gives an answer there. And uh, subsampling for very size this exponent are given by these other curves. So at, at square root subsampling is the black curve, and you can see it's just failing. It's running, it's subsampling, it's cal calculated in a way, and it gives out an answer, it's just the wrong answer. And you wouldn't know that as a user of this. Well, that's a problem. Uh, if you turn that to point um, six, that's the green curve, it's still failing. At point seven and eight, it actually is not only succeeding, it's, it's, it's running faster than the bootstrap. It's a more effective use of the computational facility than the bootstrap, which is pretty interesting. But again, at point, uh, at point nine, it's failing again. So there's a range of this tuning parameter where this thing works outside of the range. It's failing, but you don't know that. You have no diagnostic for that. Uh, and more of that range varies across problems, and uh, so this became a, you know, kind of feel like a, a bit of a dead end. Okay, so this new procedure is going to, uh, call, it's called bag of little bootstraps, uh, is going to uh, you know, make progress on this problem. It's a combination of bootstrap and subsampling. It's totally parallelizable, and you don't need any analytical rescaling for it. I really bring it up not because I want to sell this procedure so much as just an example of a way of thinking that if you take this computational constraint seriously, you've got a terabyte of data, and I've got to get my error bars. How can we do that? That just makes you think about the problem differently. And so we get an answer which looks different than 40 years of work on the bootstrap, uh, which I think is really useful. And I think there's lots of other things like this that can be done. Um, OK, so let's try this out. Um, well, let's first of all motivate this idea. So here's the good, we'll go back to the same pictures before. We're going to be subsampling. So we have the data of size n. We're going to get subsamples of size b, where b is small. We're not going to just immediately apply our estimator to those small subsamples. That would give us fluctuations on the wrong scale. We're going to do something different. We're going to say, forget that there was an intermediate stage there. Those B points were also sampled from the population, IID. They're representative of the population, just like the endpoints they came from. Okay? And in fact, the same uniform convergence theorem applies to them. Uh, they're uniformly good approximation. The, the empirical, based on them, is uniformly good approximation of the truth. Now, it doesn't look very good because I have just 10 data points in my example here, but with terabytes and gigabytes you'll get a good approximation. It won't be as good as the full data set, but it'll be you know, reasonable. So now we go back to the same argument as before. We say, forget there was ever a population. You're now in a world where that's your population. It's discrete, but forget that. I could even smooth it if I chose to. Uh, it's a population, and I can sample from it. And I can get false data sets from it. And I can sample one data point from it, two data points from it. I can sample B points from it. It was based on B points. So that seems kind of natural, but that's the wrong thing to do. What you want to do is sample n data points from it, because n's the scale you're trying to do your estimation on. And that's the key new idea, is to take an empirical based on b points, which is, has a small footprint, and use it to generate data sets artificially of size n. And this can now be done in a distributed way. OK, so let's just make, drive that point home. What we're really doing is taking a subsample of size b, and we're using bootstrap procedures on the subsample to get out an error bar from a single subsample that's a correct error bar. And then we're going to do that in parallel multiple times. All right, so here's a picture that I think was the best way to explain this. Here's the original data sitting over there of size n, where n is, let's say, a terabyte. Um, 
we get a subsample of size. Uh, in the example I'll show, that comes, you know, if you're just talking about terabytes, uh, you know, uh, uh, say four gigabytes roughly. So four gigabytes needs to be sent down that arrow, right? Then that uppermost box up there is in parallel, you run the bootstrap on that subsample. And you get an error bar that's a correct error bar at scale n. But it's noisy because it was based on one subsample, so why not do it in parallel multiple times? So you have this doubly nested parallelism. Uh, that gives you multiple error bars, and you combine the error bars in some way. In our paper, we used averaging, um, but I uh, uh, do not believe that's the best or even a reasonable, necessarily reasonable way to do things. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're going to take multiple error bars and then combine them in a way to get an overall aggregate error bar. So each error bar is going to be kind of noisy, correct but noisy, and then the combination process will hopefully drive the noise back down. So you get a paralyzed, fast version of this procedure. Okay. Um, Okay, so, so let me just, uh, I want to finish here in a couple of minutes, so let me just uh, cut to the chase. Here's the same experiment as before, where we had the synthetic data, the bootstrap is the blue curve, and this is this new BLB procedure for all values of that exponent. It's actually working. It's actually running faster even on a single computer than the bootstrap, which is kind of interesting in and of itself. The bootstrap seems so naively uh, kind of the way to do it that, you know, how can you beat the bootstrap? But you can. Um, all right, so it works for values that exponent. All right, now here's the next slide is the one I want to emphasize. Uh, this is now if we actually go to a cloud computer. So we're now going to go to Amazon EC2, and we're going to work with, I think this experiment was a quarter terabyte of data, and we're going to try to get an error bar. All right, now in this case, we don't have the true error bar. It's, we don't, can't do the experiment. Um, so what do we compare to? Um, so what we did was we did a kind of a, uh, so this was going to be logistic regression on a quarter terabyte of data. So what we did is we said that we did the following. Well, we have to get an error bar somehow. Let's use, uh, it's logistic regression. Let's use uh, the, the bootstrap in a kind of a dumb way. Uh, what we're going to do is use our EC2 to parallelize logistic regression. Okay, and all of you in the room kind of know how to do that, you know, stochastic gradient or whatever. Uh, it, you know, it takes a few days to weeks of kind of time to do that and to debug it and get it working and all, but you can do it. Uh, and now what you do is you take your original data centrally, quarter terabyte, you resample the replacement once, and you put it on your cloud computer, run parallelized logistic regression, and you get an, an one, one answer, one, one point estimate. Then you resample your data centrally again, and you put it back on your cloud computer, and you run it again, and you get now a second estimate. And you do that a bunch of times, and now you're doing the bootstrap sequentially on your parallel computer. Okay, so that's the, what we compare to. All right, so f here are these results. So here again is time on the x-axis, relative error. The bootstrap is coming down, that's the blue curve, you know, one resampling, two resamplings, three resamplings, and so on. So you get an idea of the amount of time it took to do this, this um, single point estimate, uh, sort of on the order of a couple thousands of seconds. Uh, it comes down to some answer by about 15,000 seconds. Um, okay, so the new procedure is just, we just implemented in parallel, Ariel did this, uh, this exact algorithm, there's the flow diagram, and this took much less time than parallelizing logistic regression. It's just a few lines of code on Spark, um, and uh, it runs, it doesn't have to iterate, it just runs in that flow diagram style and gives that an answer, uh, and that's the red dot here. So the total runtime for the algorithm was about 300 seconds, and the accuracy was better than what, what Bootstrap gets after about 15,000 seconds. Um, okay, so that really to me is remarkable, you know, it's just really orders of magnitude beating the Bootstrap in a, in a, in a useful way. You wouldn't wait 15,000 seconds to give me an error bar if you're Google serving up some service, right? But 300 seconds is within the range of people at Google who are smart can make this fast enough to run in, you know, maybe real time. Um, and I don't think this is specific to this algorithm, you know. I, so, you know, uh, this matters, um, you know. Uh, I wouldn't publish this in the New York Times, but I, I do think it's at a conference like this worth trumpeting that you can do this kind of thing. And if we rethink our way our, we approach statistics, Taking in seriously the constraints of systems engineers who build parallel computing, uh, we're going to come up with different kinds of procedures. It's not going to just be making you know, SVMs faster a little bit or you know, taking interior point methods and tweaking them and so on. It could be really different. And I think that's what we often miss, that we should be working on things that are inspired in this way, especially in this particular community. Um, all right, so I'm finished. Um, uh, there was a couple of slides I'm going to skip. If you want to publish this kind of work in statistics uh, journals, by the way, to make an impact on statistics, you can do all that stuff and they won't publish it. You have to then publish things like that, all these equations with Edgeworth expansions, and then they'll accept it, even though these equations are trivial. So we did some proof of the theoretical correctness of this algorithm, which is 
no big deal. I shouldn't be saying this on a video, but it's true. <laughs> uh, and the main message is this little slide right there, but they, they, I don't know if they care, but they should. <laughs> All right, so uh, I think that's the end of my talk. Uh, okay, so that was a big data talk. Uh, and it wasn't about how great is big data, you know, and all that. It was about, let's be concerned about big data. But also, let's use it as a driving function for us to work on some new problems. There really are some very thorny, difficult problems that we haven't even begun to address. And so these are just a little few vignettes that we've been working on in my group. Uh, but if we're going to really be serious about being engineering-oriented people who build systems that people can really rely on for their daily decisions of some kind, you know, we've got to be serious about the trade-off curves and the, and the and the running times and the speeds and the accuracies and how all these emerge and have a theory that links them. So actually, it's not just about empirical stuff either. It's really theoretical. Uh, if we're going to give guarantees that mean something, it has to be theoretical guarantees. So when we start to take a problem, divide it into pieces and worry about that, we've got to prove new theorems that you know, give us a guarantee for that. So that also drives, I think there's going to be a lot of business for theoreticians in the next, uh, next wave of activity. All right, so thanks very much. We have time for a couple of questions. So in the little bootstrap, <coughs> I don't understand uh, something. The, uh, as n becomes large compared to b, it seems that the, the diversity or the variations you see in each uh, 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 sample of size n uh, becomes very small compared to other samples of size n. If I compare to a real data, so how could the math work? Okay, so for, first of all, you're alluding to a really important point. Why does the subsampling actually fail? It is a diversity issue. If you have you know, a huge amount of data points in, and B is really tiny, okay, every little, you know, the, uh, the, the, the noise dominates at that point, all right? Every little subsample is not very representative. You get a huge amount of noise. Even if you combine them, it doesn't beat, you know, the, uh, the entropy. If you get a really big subsamples, at some point, I mean, imagine the subsample is actually of size N. There's only one such subsample, and you only get one point. That's a bad error bar. All right, so that, in that regime, the entropy is no good. All right, so this new procedure works all the way up to that point because at that point, it's doing, it's doing the bootstrap, which restores the entropy by, by resampling the subsample. Okay, so um, uh, you know, that, that's the, uh, I guess, the, 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 there was another point you were making, though. Let me, I, that was kind of triggered by what you said. But, yeah. Yeah, so, so, uh, so the other point here is that this theory, and, and in practice we did, this is IID sampling. Okay, when you have IID sampling, each subsample has, you know, maybe not be so representative, but it's going to be fair, somewhat representative. It can't be unrepresentative by IID. Um, but now, there, of course, there's a whole literature on the bootstrap, which, you know, has, works for time series and, and um, you know, other dependent data, where you subsample with replacement, respecting some of the dependence in your data. Now, there's a, the moving blocks bootstrap and so on and so forth. That's orthogonal to what I've been talking about here. You can do that here, too. And moreover, when you have the data on multiple servers, you want to probably want to stratify. Your subsamples shouldn't be random. They should be stratified. So there's kind of a nice orthogonal cut through the space about how to sample, how to handle dependent data and all, which, again, a lot of that was done in the bootstrap literature, but revisiting it now from our modern point of view, I think will be really, really interesting. Okay. So um, I want to take you back to where you sort of said there's this dichotomy of um, I don't want to integrate over the parameters because I don't want to choose a prior. Yeah. Um, which I thought was a little bit weak because you're choosing a model. So you, you kind of, when you're choosing a prior, you're choosing a model. And I think y you've got this really nice perspective on this dichotomy. And I think what you're sort of saying when you're doing the bootstrap is actually this is providing me guarantees about the performance of my model. Um, but what can you do? Can you not just combine both here? Why can't you just take the Bayesian analysis and put that through the same pipeline? And are there problems with doing that? Or uh, Because you sort of present it as a dichotomy, but is it a dichotomy, or can we not just get the best of both worlds? Okay, a lot of questions there that I probably should answer over a beer later in the uh, airport bar. Um, uh, yeah, so the, you know, all statistics is of any kind is based on modeling assumptions. And so the model itself has got them in there. It's just that when you're trying to think about error bars in the Bayesian framework, you're really putting in a lot of the error bar in the prior. Okay? The tails of the, pr of the prior particularly affect directly, uh, you know, much more directly. So I'm just as, I, I become less comfortable with the Bayesian framework when I'm thinking about the error bar here um, and more comfortable with the frequentist framework. All right? Great. 
So you want to respond? Well, actually, I... no, that's what I was curious about, because when you pull these two things together, I think that's where yeah. you get this confusion. You've got two different yeah. error bars that mean two different things. Yeah, and yet so people are interpreting them as the same thing. Yeah, and if you right. did try and pull these two things together yeah. at the end, yeah. so you could what bootstra- error bar you could would you bootstrap, bootstrap your error bars? Yeah. Yeah, you could bootstrap an error of Bayesian procedure. It's yeah. kind of conceptually a little hairy. But then what and my, my concern is often explaining that to the user. That Bayesian procedure gave you an error bar, but I'm not happy with that error bar, so I'm going to do this other weird stuff on the outside and give you another error bar. Um, so I, I wouldn't rule it out. It's just kind of uh, you know not the one I would necessarily first think of doing here. Um, so I, you know, I think I'm, I'm a Bayesian antifrequentist. It depends on the problem. If I have a lot of prior knowledge, I work with a person for a long amount of time, I will probably be a little more of a Bayesian. I want to get that prior and use it and exploit it as much as I can. A lot of this work is done in the context of someone who's writing a piece of software that'll be used by hundreds of thousands of people around the world. And there's no time to assess priors for any of that stuff. That's, you kind of want to pull away from the prior when you're trying to give these, these, these error bars. Um, but you know, let's think about our own medical, personal medical decisions later in the day over a beer and decide whether you prefer the bootstrap kind of procedures or the Bayesian procedures. kind of depends. One more quick question. So could we go back to uh, the, the, the part you were doing about the privacy, uh, yeah. differential privacy, where you're talking about uh, each person has some notion of their own version of privacy. Yes. So have you thought about um, where in different databases, uh, different people's attributes are getting merged, say in Google, Amazon, maybe on a Facebook database, and there's a different problem when you think about differential privacy in the sense that it's a very strict notion of privacy and how you would relax that in some sense in some sense in some meaningful way so that you could look at the utility and the degradation of the data and the trade-off between the two. Okay, again, a great question that needs a really long answer, but just let me say part of my comfort with differential privacy is that it composes well. If I'm losing a little privacy here and a little privacy in this other database, a little privacy here, differential privacy allows me to control in a strong way the total privacy lost over all those multiple queries and multiple databases. And until we have another competing formalism that does so well at that, uh, as more of a theoretically inclined person, I, I'm kind of like to stay close to this this particular. I mean, if you want to propose such a formalism, I'm all ears. So but why I don't not think it random exists. differential privacy or k anonymity? Sorry. Why not k anonymity or random differential privacy? Why okay. do he? Again, that's probably a take it offline and discuss okay. it a longer. There, are, yes. The basic message, though, is kind of the same. You want, if you can put them into Minimax, you can also do this kind of theory, and I think that's what we should be doing. Great discussion, but we are out <laughs> over time, so let's thank.